less than two weeks, we've done three cases of patients with trigeminal neuralgia related to tumor uh, scarring and vascular lesions. And these are the most common non-vascular causes that I have in my practice. Uh, and they happen to come sort of one after another. So I'll show these to you and you get a sense of what we find. Uh, this is a woman who I operated on 2013 for a huge, much bigger than this, epidermoid causing facial pain and numbness. Uh, and her facial pain and numbness did get better for many years, but she presented with a recurrence. Um, and she has also a recurrence of the epidermoid. And this is the typical appearance. Uh, the nerve root is distorted and barely visible here. So at surgery, this is the initial view. Uh, and uh, so let's just see uh, who is on. I guess attendees are going to have to raise your hand. How huh? is that if, uh, if I want to call on Halima? Or I can just allow you to talk. All right, Halima. Um, in fact, uh, do you know if I can allow more than one person to talk at the same time? I'm not, not sure about that. We can try. You can. You yes, can. you can. All right, Jeff, um, Matt. Um, I'll go through the last one to talk. I see. So if I'm allowed too many, I think we're going to get a lot of backup, uh, background noise. Yeah, we, okay. We'll just have to mute the residents. That's fine. So uh, Halima, you're up first, top left. Um, first of all, is this the right or the left side? Well, Dr. Bison, we can't see your Can, uh, screen. You, you cannot see my screen? No. It doesn't. Okay. Well, thank you for letting me know that. <laughs> we could see it before, but it stopped sharing. It's going to be a lot harder for you to answer the questions if you can't see the screen, that's for sure. <laughs> now, can you see it? Yes. Okay, so top left, um, how can you tell which side of the head we're on? This is a posterior fossa retrosigmoid approach. So, um, medial is towards the left side of the screen and lateral is towards the right side of the screen? Well, actually that's the question I'm asking you because once you know medial and lateral, then you know left and right. So um, let's say you walked in, let, let's say you are, you know, doing, you're on the ward uh, you're, you know, you're making phone calls and you come in because you know that there's a re-exploration going on. You forget the patient so you don't remember which side it is. And you come into the operating room and this is all you see. And that's not an uncommon scenario, right? Because you're running around during the day as PGY one, two, and threes. And sometimes all you get is a snippet of 10 minutes or five minutes of what's happening in an OR. Uh, and you don't want to stop and interrupt people and ask them, so how do you orient yourself to an intraoperative view like this, knowing it's a posterior fossa exploration for a trigeminal neuralgia case? So that gives you a whole bunch of information right there. What, what part of the posterior fossa are we going to usually explore in a trigeminal neuralgia case? And with the CP angle. And I'm sorry, I barely hear you. Can you make sure you're talking close to the mic? Mm -hmm. So most likely we would do like a retrosig approach. So okay. we're, look, we're trying to look at the, uh, the, the CPI, like the, the root entry zone for the, the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so where does that put you in the posterior fossa? Is the root entry zone at the foramen magnum? No. No, it's, it's way above, up high. Above, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you're looking up high and you see 
you, t you see an angle and you know that your approach is high, that's not likely to be the frame and magnum down low and the front of the petrus, right? You know you're high. So yes. if this is high up in the posterior fossa and you see this in our way of where we're aiming over here, does that help you? This is the top of the cerebellum, this is the petrus bone, and then this is the, this is the tentorium. So then this nerve would probably be which? So, so the structure that you were initially pointing to would be like the seven, eight complex? Good, okay. So now uh, we sort of work our way towards the right and we see this whole stretched out complex here. Um, and uh, what is this? What is this needle over here? This is no, nerve stimulator. Nerve stimulator. So we're confirming that this is seven. Um, and then we see procedure. And then the question is, how does one try to help a patient like this? Um, and so often, whether it is scar tissue or tumor, you're going to try to find the plane between the nerve and the tumor. In tumor cases, the pain is, seems to be caused by compression and displacement away from the tumor. And so the idea would be to separate the nerve uh, from the tumor, reach behind it, and get out as much as you can and free it up. Um, so what we saw in the beginning uh, was the nerve laterally displaced towards the viewer um, and then at the end, we see the nerve relaxed. Um, now, in this, in this interval here, if we magnify this view, we see this structure in the distance. And for bonus points, what is that structure? Here's, here's the unmagnified view. So you've got Cerebellum, seven, eight, five. Petro, tentorial junction, looking in the distance, and we focus here. Um, that be the third? It's too high up. I'm sure you're speaking, but I don't hear it. Would that be? The third nerve? Third nerve, excellent, okay. And for a star on top of the bonus, what is this slightly pink structure beneath it? I, the peak one? Okay, no, it's oh, below I the see nerve. It. I... This slightly uh... pink structure above the nerve would be the P1 segment. And this one therefore is superior cerebellar. Okay, superior. next case, a 76 year old female with MS and trigeminal neuralgia. And uh, her 2018 operation, uh, this is the preoperative study on the left. Uh, this is what we found at surgery. Uh, and you can see branches of superior cerebellar artery. You see evidence of thinning here and then, uh, uh oh, well, this video did not work. Uh, anyway, that showed the nerve bouncing back and forth and the, uh, and the postoperative findings. And now uh, she, prevent, she presents with a recurrence of pain um, and you see the, the sponge in its location. Uh, and here is, here's the approach. Uh, so Matt, are you on the, are you on, have you been promoted to speak on this? Yes, sir. Okay. So now here, this is a re, a re -op. Again, you can see the sutures we've reopened. Uh, again, this is a left-sided case. So what is this blue line that the heads up display is showing here? Uh, I believe that's the Petrus bone. Okay. Any other any other thoughts? 
the blue line that looks sort of like a vascular structure. What is it purporting to show? The uh, sigmoid sinus. Yep. So this is the, this is the transverse sigmoid junction, and you can see that it's not inaccurate, uh, fairly accurate here. And this purple is showing what we've outlined as where where we think we are going to end up uh, going for the, uh, the scar tissue, and the fifth nerve is in is in yellow here. Um, and that's actually not surprising because. Uh, we're, we're looking way up high here to try to get cerebellar adhesions away from the tent. It's going to be a little lower. And as we go deeper, we see that there's a fairly good overlap between the purple, which is the granuloma slash pillow, and the yellow, which is the nerve, uh, which you can see over here. And uh, in contrast to the tumor cases, often on the recurrent cases, uh, there is some mass effect displacing the nerve, but there's so much scarring that the surface of the nerve is often pulled and distorted towards, towards the granuloma, uh, such that pulling and traction are the mechanism of pain, I think, or at least the mechanical cause of the mechanism of pain. And so this ends up being a tedious process that I won't you know, go through the whole thing on, of slowly teasing that away uh, and then we see some, uh, some other structures coming into play here. So this is what then, Matt, Tentorium, the fifth nerves to the left, and this is a. So is that uh, fourth nerve? That's right. It's got a very characteristic, very thin appearance. You can almost always recognize it just by its caliber. Uh, and then if you see it diving into the tent from below, then you know it's the fourth nerve. Um, and then. Uh, this is probably the superior cerebellar artery that has been displaced uh, by the previously placed sponge. Um, and then that's the, uh, that's the final product. And she had a good, good response the second time as well. Last case is a trigeminal AVM. I have, I don't know, about eight of these, I think, that I have, I've done that have caused trigeminal neuralgia. And here you see the compression of the nerve root entry zone. It is a subarachnoid lesion. It is, does not involve the brainstem, but it does involve the peel surface. And unfortunately, most of the pathology is medial to the fifth nerve and in the fifth nerve. Because what we're looking at here is the fifth nerve itself with dilated tortuous veins over the surface of the fifth nerve. Um, we've gone over this in conference, so you'll know that we targeted uh, the duplicated branches of the superior cerebellar artery, the ICA uh, branches, and targeted those one by one, both preoperatively, Dr. Berenstein embolizing these, uh, and surgically um, here. And I won't go through the great details of this case, uh, except to show you that the anatomy that we outlined preoperatively really did help. Uh, she did also have hearing problems preoperatively caused by microvascular compression of the eighth nerve. Uh, and here you see we put a temporary clip on to make sure there was no dropout since we knew this was a branch of ICA. But ICA is coming under the nerve, goes back under the fifth nerve you see distorted here and into the AVM that's medial to the fifth nerve. And here you see the same anatomy uh, this is on the left where my mouse is. This is the eighth nerve. There's a clip here on the artery, uh, which is going medial. This is the surface of the brainstem that you can see is covered with these veins that I've started to take. This is the primary draining vein. And here you see the fifth nerve with those veins and arteries that are causing 
compression uh, and have to be dealt with. And the idea here is to come along the surface of the brainstem and coagulate these little feeders one by one, even on the fifth nerve until this vein becomes black or blue. Um, and uh, it's, it's very tight quarters. It can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, you can see the compression. This is the motor route of five that you saw there for a second. For a second. Uh, and as, as we work, we check the sound of the draining vein to see if we're having a qualitative influence on it, uh, occasionally bringing in the heads up display to help, at least I think it helps, uh, and then slowly come across the malformation uh, and eventually uh, hopefully get it out. Um, and then the, um, the angiogram, the ICG angiogram, but this is what the nerve looks like at, at the end with all of the surface vessels coagulated and trying to spare this, to spare this nerve in the final view. Uh, she, did, she did report an immediate increase uh, in, a uh, decrease in pain, <laughs> a decrease. Good, okay, so that went on a little longer. Why don't I turn it back over to you guys? Great, thank you. And now uh, Susie's gonna make a presentation update on the operating room. Sorry, Dr. Kellner, I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, I have your slides up, I can share mine. Oh, awesome. So good morning, everyone. Um, today I'm just gonna present a, like a monthly update on our OR operations. Um, on the agenda are some of the OR metrics that we are tracking, um, bumping policy, the changes in the OR. Next slide. So some of the OR metrics that we're tracking, which you probably know already are the first case on time start. Um, the data here is from the from July 27th to August 7th, and we did incredible, incredibly well. Uh, we almost had an 80% first case on time start uh, with the 10 minute grace period. Um, as you can see, the reasons for delay are prolonged room setup, patient lateness, surgeon lateness. Um, so from these causes of reasons, we have some proposed solutions, which we might have to engage the office scheduler to um, encourage patients to arrive two hours before the schedule on time, uh, first scheduled start time. And some things that I noticed at Mount Sinai West is surgeons are usually present about 15 minutes before the scheduled time to sign all the paperwork and also address all patients' concerns, which will help. Um, allowing the residents to finish their didactics about 15 minutes before the scheduled time so they can get to the room um, at a reasonable time will also help. Also, as you can also tell here, we're kind of really reliant on that 10 minute grace period. Without the 10 minute grace period, we're at 50%. So we're trying to wean off from being reliant on this 10 minute grace period. The next slide will show um, how we perform compared to the whole hospital at Mount Sinai East. Uh, we're at the top three uh, top performers uh, regarding first case on time start, um, leading by ENT, um, then neurosurgery and followed by GU. Next slide, we'll go over the turnover time. Um, for the same two week period, we're um, averaging about 62 minutes turnover time. Um, what I want to encourage for the next month or so is to encourage the nurses to actually document what the delay reason is so we have area to improve on. Uh, but some things that we think will help is actually uh, communicating with the circulating nurse, especially if you have a case to follow, when 30 minutes to room out is so they can expedite the next patient and getting um, communicating with the floor nurses to get sign out for the next patient as well, which may help. Uh, before beginning the day, hopefully the surgeons, I know this probably on the schedule already, communicating with the nurse and get a rundown of the whole day's cases and needs. So SPD and other equipment managers will have uh, awareness of what's, what is needed for all your cases. Uh, one of the things that we're actually initiating and I need the residents help and um, the APPs and the OR is basically writing the time out of each patient with the time in of each the following patient, just so we have an awareness of this time lapse. 
the nurses here doesn't seem like they are really looking at the status board and knowing that the turnover time is ticking uh, as opposed to Mount Sinai West where they're always looking at the status board and trying to meet that metric. So that is an educational thing that I will go over with the OR nurses so that they're more aware of this time lapse. Um, so that will be what I'll be focusing on. Next slide will show how we measure uh, compared to other clusters in the hospital. Um, as you can tell, Annabur 8 has always been above 60 minutes uh, compared to cardiothoracic in the east. Well, I think cardiothoracic, which I already uh, checked for last year, just for compare, I mean, last month, which just for comparison's sake, is around 51 to 53 minutes turnover time. Um, of course, I think we can definitely do better if there's more assistance during the turnover time, more of our uh, surgical team presence, I feel like uh, getting in about 45 minutes is very reasonable. Um, next slide, we're going over it in pre-incision time. Uh, that's one of the metrics that we're tracking. We're hovering around 75 minutes. Um, that is including anesthesia, getting ready, and also prepping and before, right before incision. Next slide. Other things that we're tracking includes the case length accuracy. We're at 11% right now. Um, I think one of the problem is that we tend to under schedule or, or over schedule. Under scheduling, um, just so you know, Epic has a feature where, where it will tell you the last recent, the free, the recent five cases and their time case length. So if you use that as a guidance, it should help. But in addition to that, uh, if you add the pre-incision time average to that, that might increase your accuracy. So I, the previous slide already shows you what our average pre-incision time. I can also provide you broken down by surgeon so you know what your pre-incision time average is. And that hopefully if you add that to your case length, it will increase the accuracy on that end. Uh, one other metrics that we're also tracking is to see how GP2 is doing, our processing department. Unlike Mount Sinai West where they are on the same floor as the OR, GP2 is on a different building, different floor. So we just wanna see how well they're doing and they're averaging about 84 minutes um, from the time patient arrived to their assessment being done. Um, we'll work on seeing if we can move this closer to our holding area. So hopefully that will be less of a problem, but that is in the works right now. Next topic um, is the what about phone. transport? Uh, yes, transport is that. Yes, that will uh, transport is usually about there for the first case has been pretty good for uh, second and third cases is a little bit longer. Uh, most of our second cases are from the unit. So transporting is a little bit more difficult, especially since they're from the ICU or step down unit They have to go straight to the room. So if we have a surgical team member in the room that will help a lot with the communication, then we will know right away when the room has all the trays so we can start um, moving the patient to the OR. But if it's from GP2, of course, we always add about 10 minutes transport time. And also we might not always have the transport available to transport the patient as well. Um, therefore, if we move the holding area closer to our home base, which is uh, at number eight, hopefully that will help with the efficiency. Well, I'm, Susie, these are the, this is the best data that has ever come out since I've been at Mount Sinai. I really cannot compliment you highly enough on this. There's more, much more to discuss. In fact, every one of those slides that you showed opens a discussion that we must have. Uh, so we're gonna need to spend some more time on this. Uh, and maybe it will be at a faculty meeting or meeting uh, or grand rounds that is just devoted to this process, but it's very important. It touches on everything we do. And you, you've already pointed out numerous holes in our process that need to be changed. Yes. Some of which are easier to change than others. Yes, we're limited by we have limited by staffing also and by uh, real estate organization. So um, although we have this idea of moving it closer, we just don't have the real estate or the area to uh, process our patients efficiently pre-op. You know, I think um, for, for Raj, you may want to engage the faculty in each one of the slides uh, that Susie showed because each area has its own little project. Uh, you know, just getting, getting us there 15 minutes earlier would require a whole revamp of our conference schedule and so on and so forth. So there may be other ways to do this.
but there are a lot of action items, getting the patients there two hours before, a clock that's ticking, maybe we can have a big stopwatch in, in each OR that gets turned on so that everyone sees what's happening in terms of room turnover, which I think is the biggest, a big issue. Mm -hmm. And the biggest number that you presented there, by far the highest, biggest, largest number is uh, what we used to call OFAT time. But from when the patient arrives to the skin incision, 75 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that is our biggest area for opportunity right there. Can some of that be done in the holding area, for example? If there's, if there's a 60 minute turnover time while the patient's in holding and half of the 75 minutes is line placement, then why, then can we place the lines outside? Or, you know, are there things that can be done outside that will streamline this process? I've, seen, I've been in other places like Barrow and others that also at the time had limited real estate, but that is how they made use of their holding area to minimize that time in the OR for the, that preparatory work. Uh, Raj, do you have any comments? I think uh, our anesthesiologist has been really good with trying to put IVs in the holding area, but as long as it doesn't delay the patient going into the room when the room is ready, we're, I think Dr. Tori has been really good about that and his team. Um, sorry, I, just, um, I was um, oh, sorry about that. No, no problem. I was just not. Um, I was uh, raising my hand. So, you know, Susie's done an outstanding job. She's done a lot of work in this area, and I think if I can just comment on two things. One is, um, you know, the turnover for us has always historically been one of our biggest issues, and I think what Susie's identifying is if we can really be granular to see where it is, rather than just always have this attitude of it's it's a built-in problem because I think once we actually analyze the areas, I think we can actually make tangible improvement. I do think it's, it's really all of us. It's a, it's a culture issue. And um, whenever Susie and I sit down and look at it, I think a lot of this can actually be addressed. I don't think it's going to be that hard as long as we organize ourselves um, in terms of really taking ownership of that turnover time rather than thinking in terms of silos. So I think that's really going to be an area where we can actually make significant improvement. And then the second point I just wanna make from Susie's talk too, is that I think what we need to also think about is, and I mentioned this last time, is just collegiality amongst each other. If you have another surgeon following you, identifying when you think you're gonna be done, potentially even texting that faculty member or attending is very helpful. And I think goes a long way. And it's a, it's a, good, it's a good culture kind of, of looking out for each other. So, I mean, those are the two things I think that are gonna help us overall. Okay, good, thank you. Um, the next uh, topic on my presentation is the bumping policy. I understand that Dr. Shivastav actually presented this um, at the last month faculty meeting. Uh, I just wanna reiterate that the goal of this is to create equity in the department. And the purpose is basically to streamline and eliminate any stress or confusion in the event if there's an emergency case uh, in the middle of the night or that goes into the early morning. Um, therefore, when you do receive a text from me, it does not mean that you're definitely gonna be bumped. It's just in the case of a, a category one that will potentially happen. So um, the resident won't be stressing to find out which room to designate and evaluate the day's uh, worth of caseload at that moment. Um, there is a bump log with all the designated rooms. So if you, anyone wants to review that with me, come, feel free to come by and I'll show you um, how these rooms are designated and also who is designated and their, whether they're actually bumped or not and all that logistics. Um, the next part of the presentation is actually some of the OR updates that have been happening for the past month or so. The first one is the SSI prevention update. Um, in the June 20, the June um, grand round, 
we actually presented the, um, the interop and pre-op bundle, um, just so I can give you a sense of where we're at right now. Out of 136 cases last month, 98% were swabbed for staph aureus. 20% um, of them are MSSA positive and 3% uh, are MRSA. And that's very important because we actually pre-treated or post-treated these patients adequately and changed their antibiotic uh, regimen during a surgery to uh, meet their to uh, meet their results. So uh, I just want to thank everybody who has been very diligent with uh, getting these patients swabbed and getting these patients treated. Um, and basically, I also want you to be aware of this antibiotic guidelines that were released by infection prevention on our cases and what they recommend as intraop antibiotics. For example, cranial cases should get cefuroxamine or uh, spine cases getting uh, cefalazolin. Um, if you do need any of this guideline, please reach out to me and I'll email you the guideline uh, just so that we're on the same page. The only way we can find out what are the causes or um, the root causes of our infection is to make sure we standardize as many things as we can and see what is the outlier and what is the different things that's causing, potentially causing um, these infections. Um, of course, all this will not replace hand hygiene and best practices. So um, there's also standardized prep, glove changes uh, regimen for um, all our cases as well. Um, next project that we're focusing on as well as the preference cards to not over to not overwhelm our SPD, we've noticed that most of our trays that come up are not utilized. So we've been tracking what trays are open during each case and making a spreadsheet. Um, from Tanvir and from the OR, we got the most frequent CPT code used by surgeon um, for, the, for the last two years, and that's already compiled. We're planning to collaborate with the most experienced OR staff to basically uh, tidy up our preference cards. Once that is done, I'll release it to all of you guys and then see if you want us to add any of the supplies or any equipment or any instruments. And then we'll kind of put it in this epic system. So um, all our services will see it, SPD and uh, our equipment managers as well. After this is done, I'm hoping to um, measure the instrument utilization for tray because these trays tend to be very heavy as well as a very physical uh, stress for our OR staff. So hopefully we can streamline these instruments and make it more reflective of our certain issues and that will help with efficiency and cost uh, for the hospital. Uh, last but not least, um, something that we've been doing is we have been evaluating and um, revamping our Anabur 8 instrument tray storage area. As you can tell, if you walk down that hallway, there is a cranial cart, a spine, an endoscopic, and a, um, uh, it's basically a navigation system cart. These are all organized by our OR staff and our SPD um, team. So I thank all of them for that. And basically we'll try to make sure that we maintain this so it's easier for our OR staff to find the trays that we need. And hopefully that will help with our turnover as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Susie, I, you know, I, I'll keep repeating it. It's it's awesome work. This is, this is, we've never even come close to this quality of analysis of what we're doing. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're all ears. We're strongly supportive. Uh, I feel like you need a whole army of people to help you fix this, but you know you've got our you've got our full support. If if you and Raj want, you may want to start assigning position leaders for each one of your projects uh, that you can you can collaborate with. Yes. Anyone who uses our ORs is game to mm -hmm. you know is is eligible to be called upon to take part in this. We're all responsible for it. So uh, as you as you develop more and more work that needs to be done, please call on us. Definitely. I will need all your support. And I thank you so much for your um, support already, Dr. Bredesen. Good. Okay. Thank you. So we're a couple minutes behind schedule, but hopefully we'll get through all the presentations today. Um, and if we don't, we can always move on to a later week. Um, so today we have the pleasure of giving our students and pre-residency fellows uh, the platform to present their research. We're going to start with the sub-interns, uh, 
Corey, Remy, and Sean have done an outstanding job on service and continue to do an outstanding job on service as they finish up their rotations. Um, they are all applying to neurosurgery residencies this year and each have uh, very interesting sort of sub niches in their research. Uh, Corey will be going first. He's going to be presenting on a series of projects that he has worked on since uh, he spent some time at MGH um, getting started in this research area and then continued uh, with Raj Srivastava in our department, looking at the genetics and genomics of meningioma and some associated projects um, related to uh, imaging of uh, meningiomas as well. So Corey, I'll give, I'll give the screen share to you. Awesome, thank you. Is that up? Looks good. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, so uh, I just want to start by obviously thanking the department um, for the, the time and the mentorship. Um, last year with Dr. Shavastava with my research year, and then over the last two months with Subai. Um, it's been a really uh, fantastic experience and looking forward to applying this year into neurosurgery. So the title of the talk today is The Genomic Advances in Meningiomas. Um, meningiomas are the most common primary brain tumors. There's approximately 27,000 uh, meningioma cases diagnosed in the U.S. each year. And Harvey Cushing wrote in 1938 that certain of those supposedly benign tumors, however similar in their external appearance, and however carefully they might be surgically removed, were prone in course of time to recur. And if you look at these two Kaplan-Meier curves, the top is representing recurrence-free survival, and the bottom is overall survival. And these curves are split by grade one benign meningiomas, grade two atypical, and grade three anaplastic. You can see that median recurrence-free survival for an atypical meningioma is about seven to eight years. And then median recurrence-free survival for a grade three anaplastic meningiomas is about two years. On the bottom is overall survival. And for an anaplastic grade three meningioma, also median overall survival is two years. As of now, the mainstay of treatment for meningiomas remains neurosurgical resection with or without radiotherapy. And to date, there are no effective chemotherapeutics for meningiomas in the recurrent setting. Harvey Cushing wrote, the attempt to classify these tumors on a histopathological basis alone is not enough. And indeed, in the early 1990s, early genomic work identified that approximately 40 to 50% of meningiomas harbor NF2 gene alterations, which encodes for the Merlin protein. And this is associated with the neurofibromatosis syndrome type two. However, a large barrier to identifying recurrent genomic alterations in tumors has been cost. If you look back in 2001, the cost to sequence a genome was $100 million. And this has come down drastically, whereas now in 2020, to sequence a genome is under $1,000. So this has allowed for large cohorts of samples to be amassed and for them to be sequenced to identify recurrent alterations. And indeed in 2013 was known within neuro-oncology as the year of the meningioma where four high impact papers came out nearly simultaneously that I identified that beyond NF2, there are four recurrent alterations in AKT1, Smoothin, TRAF7, and KLF4. And what was interesting from these four papers was that there was emerging data to suggest that if you have a meningioma that's located on the convexity, it is likely that the underlying tumor genomics of that meningioma differs significantly from a meningioma that occurs along the skull base region. So in 2016, was when I was at MGH, we uh, um, amassed a cohort of 62 anterior skull base meningiomas, and we performed targeted sequencing of AKT1 and Smoothin and identified that 30% of anterior skull-based meningiomas harbor clinically actionable mutations. Moreover, we were able to identify that smoothen mutations were associated with the olfactory groove location and were significantly larger in size. Next, we expanded to the posterior fossa and similarly performed targeting sequencing of smoothen and AKT1 in 61 posterior fossa meningiomas and identified that 57% of foramen magnum meningiomas harbor AKT1 mutations. 
Interestingly, if you look at an axial MRI scan of meningioma and you measure tumor sectional area, um, and you see of greater than 25.8 centimeters square with 93% sensitivity and an area under a curve of 0.9. So that's really fantastic to identify tumors that harbor a smoother mutation. So you can see here on the left, uh, olfactory group meningioma that's significantly large in size that harbors a smoother mutation compared to this olfactory group meningioma on the right that does not have a smoother mutation. You can appreciate the one that does have a smoother alteration is significantly larger. And the clinical significance of this is in another disease, basal cell carcinoma, both in the metastatic and locally advanced setting, these tumors also uh, harbor recurrent smoothen alterations. And there's a small molecule inhibitor known as Vismodigib, which targets lesions that harbor smoothen alterations. And this clinical trial uh, saw dramatic responses um, in both metastatic and locally advanced versus to the tumor when it was treated with Vismodigib. So at the time, these data allowed us to uh, open a phase two clinical trial uh, using Vismodigib for patients with progressive meningiomas. So <clears throat> the pie is beginning to close. So uh, from the early 1990s work, we know that about 40 to 50% of meningiomas harbor alterations in NF2. We now know that there are four uh, other driver mutations that we discussed previously. And others are beginning to fill in, including BAP1, PI3 kinase mutations, pol r 2 a and TERT, but still there, remains to, there still remains work to be done. And also the clinical significance of these alterations needs to be elucidated. So last year when working with Dr. Shivastava, we had two research aims. One, to identify clinically actionable mutations in meningiomas, especially in high grade and recurrent cases and two, to determine how mutation status impacts clinical presentation and survival outcomes in patients with meningiomas. We amassed a cohort of 255 meningiomas that were resected at Mount Sinai, and we performed uh, targeted DNA sequencing of uh, putative cancer genes in these samples. So interestingly, in 2016 was the most up-to-date um, uh, grading criteria for primary brain tumors. And at that time, the grading criteria for meningiomas largely remains histopathological, where you have low-grade lesions, which are WHO grade one, which are bin separately from higher grade, grade two and grade three lesions. However, for gliomas in the same 2016 edition, the treatment strata has largely switched to one that is mutational based. As you can see here, you have low-grade astrocytoma separated from glioblastoma, but large decision points in this uh, diagnosis tree is based on IDH status and ATRX loss. So we first sought to determine whether or not these similar mutations also occur in meningiomas. And indeed, we were able to identify that 2.2% of high-grade meningiomas harbor alterations in IDH1 and IDH2. And this is also at the known oncogenic loci of IDH1 R132H. And this basically supports that if you have a patient um, that is either recurrent or a high grade meningioma, you could potentially screen for the presence of an IDH gene mutation. And that patient could potentially be eligible for IDH inhibitor clinical trials for primary brain tumors that are currently open. Next, as discussed, we also uh, assessed the ATRX gene in meningiomas. And we were the first to report that nearly 7% of meningiomas similar to gliomas also harbor ATRX loss of function mutations. Importantly though, the ATRX mutation status did not impact overall survival. Moving forward, one of the potential treatment regimens that is, is now uh, being assessed in clinical trials for meningiomas is the use of immunotherapy. And we know in systemic uh, cancers, immunotherapy has shown great promise. However, looking at post hoc data from lung adenocarcinoma clinical trials, investigators have identified that for patients who had a primary lung tumor and underwent immunotherapy treatment regimens, if the primary lung adenocarcinoma harbored an SDK11 mutation, it was associated with resistance to immunotherapy. And so we sought to determine whether or not A, SDK11 mutations also occur in meningiomas and two, whether or not these similar to lung adenocarcinoma is associated with clinical outcomes. 
So first, we were indeed able to identify that 3.7% of meningiomas harbor alterations in SDK11. But more importantly, um, SDK11 mutation, similar to that in lung adenocarcinoma, is associated with decreased survival. Um, and for patients who have an SDK11 mutation, is associated with a 2.8-fold increased risk of death. And here on the Kaplan Meier curve, you can see that for patients who have a mutated in blue SDK11 gene in their meningioma, median overall survival is 4.4 years, compared to nearly 16.8 years for meningiomas that are SDK11 uh, wild type. Lastly, we moved on to uh, calculating, uh, or first we assessed preoperative imaging um, for 75 prim primary meningiomas that had not gone on uh, for a resection previously. We assessed for the presence of periotumoral edema and also measured a volume of the tumor. We calculated an edema index. So if you took the sum of edema volume plus tumor volume over tumor volume, you can uh, calculate the edema index. So if you had a, a tumor that had no edema present, it would be tumor volume over tumor volume or an edema index of one. So as your volume of edema increased, so too does your edema index. We were able to identify that patients who had larger uh, CCs of edema was also associated with a uh, higher tumor grade. So on the y-axis here, you can see uh, brain edema, uh, this in CCs from zero to 200, and tumor grade of the meningioma uh, separated into high and low grade lesions. And you can see with these box plots that for the, the median CCs of edema in a high grade meningioma is approximately 12. However, for a low grade meningioma, median CC, and this was statistically significant. Moreover, if you bend into a binary present or absent for the presence of edema, for patients who had edema present and you're looking at overall survival, it was associated with worse clinical outcomes. But the important thing was we were able to show that for every one increase in the edema index, this was associated with a 9% increase in genomic burden in these lesions. And you can see on the top here, a patient um, on the left is a T1 and on the right is an axial T2 flare. This is a grade one meningioma with a 50 cc tumor and the edema index was one. And you can see here that there's no edema present on this T2 flare sequence. This meningioma uh, harbored two single nucleotide variants in the genome of that meningioma. And this is in contrast to a similarly sized meningioma, 46 cc's, that was a grade two, so a higher grade. You can see here on the T2 flare sequence, significant edema present around the lesion and also edema pockets located in the contralateral hemisphere. For this lesion, the edema index was 3.1, and this uh, lesion had 13 sing sing single nucleotide variants present. So this basically raises two points. One, you could potentially use um, edema index as an imaging biomarker um, for neurosurgical planning of whether or not that meningioma is higher grade. Two, you could identify uh, meningiomas potentially that have a higher genomic burden and so therefore are more likely to uh, have a targetable alteration present. And three, this begs the question of whether or not similarly in gliomas, whether or not there's a role for uh, super marginal resections in meningiomas, of whether or not we should be resecting uh, the flare sequence in these meningioma samples for these. So our conclusions is one, our data expanded the list of potentially clinically actionable alterations in meningiomas. Two, we identified correlations with genomic alterations in imaging presentation. And three, these data serve as a touchstone for future clinical trials in meningioma patients. I'd like to thank um, uh, the neurosurgery department, but also I wanna highlight um, the, the amount of team effort that really took to amass this cohort. Um, at Mount Sinai, this meningioma project has been in the, in the works for many years and it's really taken a mountain to move uh, to get this project off the ground. And it definitely um, highlights the, the importance of team science and how you can use collaborations with partners in different departments um, to really uh, identify um, 
you know, identify a way to collaborate and um, at the end of the day, help patients. And I also want to um, acknowledge my former mentors, Priscilla Brastianos and Dan Cahill, MGH. And I want to thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. So I just want to um, comment maybe while there's questions, um, you know, Corey's, Corey came to us as a sophisticated yeah. researcher um, who has, as you can all see, a unique and very deep skill set. Um, he, he's worked really um, at a, an amazing high level in terms of coordination mm -hmm. and pulling things together from a, from a very talented group of, uh, that we have here for our genomics department. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Corey was the winner this year of the CNS AANS um, Young Trainee Award, which is a national neuro-oncology from the tumor section um, um, so society for which he won this award. Um, the two things I wanna make comments about Corey's talk, I don't wanna belabor this because I know we have other talks coming is that I think this is starting to look at meningiomas in a, in a way that ha um, historically has not been done before. We're trying to look at epigenetic factors like the location. Um, edema, I believe is predictive. I think it's predictive for a lot of neurologic disease. And I think beginning to start to correlate this with mutational burden, I think we'll get a better sense of behavior and moving past you know, cytopathology and so forth. So um, again, just amazing amount of work that Corey's done really tirelessly. So thank you, Corey, for your help. Thank you, Dr. Shrivastava. Really fantastic work, Corey. Um, is there heterogeneity in the genes within the tumor? Sorry, there, there's an echo. Could you repeat the question, please? Is there heterogeneity in the genomics within the tumor? You know, could you get an area of, of a meningioma that has a mutation that the rest of the meningioma does not have? Yeah, so that has been assessed. I think the, the heterogeneity is clearly not at the level of a, a GBM, um, but there is a, pa a paper out of the Brigham that was looking at uh, tert alterations and they could identify that if you did, uh, you know, took multiple cores from meningioma and also from different blocks, um, you can identify um, sort of subclones within the meningioma that are higher grade and, you know, maybe resistance to treatment. Corey, thanks for that. I, I think your point about considering the imaging implications of edema around the tumor is a really thought-provoking one. Um, while, you know, meningiomas, we think of them as extra-axial tumors, and complete resection of the tumor is considered at least somewhat curative. But the, I think as we understand the implications of brain invasion and the molecular genetics of these tumors, we may have to reconsider that notion. And these biomarkers that you can identify pre-pathology um, may be helpful in adjusting how we think about meningioma resection and reducing the likelihood of recurrence going forward. Wasn't really much of a question, more of just a comment on your, uh, <laughs> on your, on your talk, but it's, it's nice work. Thank you. Thank you. And what was interesting from that paper is, is not only was edema associated with genomics, but it was also associated with 11 fold um, likelihood of brain invasion and pathology. So. Hey, Corey, Coast is here. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Ex excellent job, Corey. Really, really proud of your work. And, and I think it's just very thoughtful and meaningful. One thought, you know, to, to think about as, as you move along with this, obviously the translational aspects of this are very important. While there's a small number of patients with those mutations, it could be quite impactful with, you know, treatments with IDH mutation, et cetera. Another area that I think is worth looking into is, is maybe with heterogeneity of the tumor is fluorescence heterogeneity. And that's something that we've looked, noticed with gliomas. The meningioma is a new area that's being studied as well. And that may have some new data that can be kind of mined out with the different levels of fluorescence and different genetic uh, aberrations that you described. So, you know, we could think about that with Raj moving forward and others, but it, you know, that may be an area to look at as well. Absolutely. Yeah, if you could send tissue from the OR, you know, lesions, the, the areas of lesions that are fluorescent more versus not, that'd be really great data.
Um, Corey, yeah, that was really great. And congratulations on your award. Um, I have a quick question about how did you do your edema um, volume measurements and did you take into consideration pe uh, patients who are on steroids? Um, so we basically measured on the axial imaging um, using manual uh, region of interests. Um, going down the axial slices to calculate both tumor volume and edema volume. Um, and that's a good point. We did not assess patients who um, were or were not on edema. Um, so that was not included in the study. Great, thank you, Corey. I think we'll move on um, just so that everybody isn't looking at the clock and wondering, we're gonna adjust a little bit so that we have time for everybody. And George and Jock have grac graciously agreed to present in September so that we have time for discussion for all these talks. Um, so we're going to move on to Remy. Uh, Remy has also spent, uh, she's, she joined us in August for her sub-I, she'll stay through September. Um, and she's going to be presenting on some of her work with the Green Beret Foundation, looking at spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury in uh, special forces, uh, special forces soldiers. Um, if I'm describing that correctly, Remy. Yes, yes. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So good morning, um, Remy Kessler. I just wanna start out by thanking Dr. Betterson, Dr. Morgan Stern, and the whole neurosurgery department for the opportunity to present my capstone research project today. This work is very personally meaningful to me. Um, and I, it's my hope that research in this area will bring light to neurotrauma in our nation's warriors. So I'll be speaking today on traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury in US Army Special Forces. We're not seeing your screen yet, Remy, so go ahead and share oh. it. <laughs> Are you able to see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So this research was conducted in close collaboration with the Green Beret Foundation, as Dr. Morgenstern had mentioned, and was also recently accepted for publication in JNS Spine. Um, I have no financial conflicts of interest. So who are the men of the US Army Special Forces or the Green Berets? They are the most elite group of warriors in America's military. They were instrumental in the raid that captured Osama bin Laden in 2011 and helped to oust the Taliban government in Afghanistan, just to name a few of their prominent missions. They are specialized in unconventional guerrilla warfare, counterterrorism, combat search and rescue, counterinsurgency support, and humanitarian missions. They are routinely deployed to over 100 different countries are the first on the ground or already at a crisis location when conflict arises. Their missions are unconventional in the sense that they are always in the highest risk enemy environments for long periods of time, typically months to years are on end where they really become part of the local population. Such military operations make these soldiers an extraordinarily unique patient population with distinct exposures to long-term combat all around the world, especially from a neurosurgical perspective and an injury perspective. Special operations includes all elite forces of the military, including the Navy SEALs and also MARSOC from the Marine Corps. However, because of the nature of the missions of the Army branch of special forces, this group actually represents a striking 60% of all special operations casualties. Given the nature of modern warfare, and specifically in the most recent wars of operations Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom in the post 9-11 era, combat related blast injuries have actually been the hallmark focus of neurotrauma research in the military. So in terms of some TBI background in the military, in 2011 alone, over 30,000 US military personnel were diagnosed with some form of TBI. And of all the combat casualties from the most recent Iraq and Afghanistan wars, TBI made up 22% and spine injury over 11% of all these casualties. And as most of you probably know, TBI has a wide variety of associated conditions, typically severe cognitive dysfunction in the long term, a variety of mental health problems such as P uh, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, depression, et cetera, and much more. In terms of spinal cord injury background in the military, it actually differs quite significantly from that which is seen in, in the civilian setting. 
This typically has to do with the polytraumatic experience of it and also the complex injury patterns. Um, in, in the war setting, we, you're looking at Humvee rollovers, you're looking at IED blasts, you're looking at patients who aren't coming in with just a spinal cord injury, but they'll have a, a wide variety of other ailments going on at the same time. And often too, they have limited access to surgical intervention because of where they are. And this is actually unique to special forces as opposed to conventional military because usually special forces aren't located at a large army base. Um, and so they're really out in remote regions. And so they can't usually get medevaced right away um, back to a base in Iraq or Afghanistan, or even back to Germany, which is where most of neurosurgery is conducted for those who are injured in the field. And so long-term effects of spinal cord injury are reproductive and sexual impairment, cardiac disease, diabetes, infection, and much more. Um, and what's interesting about this too is because most special forces soldiers are young, um, the burden of disease is quite long-term because they'll come home at around 25, 30 years old with a spinal cord injury, and then they have to receive care for this for the rest of their life. And so because of this, and because of the nature of the recent warfare, prevention of TBI and SCI is one of the highest priorities right now. So the other issue is that treating these patients is, is a huge cost to the VA system um, and also to, to the Army hospitals right now for those who are active duty. Um, and, and over a billion dollars is spent annually just treating spinal cord injury in veterans alone. Um, and, and while TBI is a really hot topic in military medicine as a whole, especially since the Gulf War, it's actually never been specifically studied in U.S. Army Special Forces. And, and this is pretty unique because U.S. Army Special Forces is actually the group that's most susceptible given the fact that they're the ones who are on the ground first and are usually conducting the, the missions that are the most uh, strenuous. So the objective of this work was to establish the current profile of TBI and SCI in special forces, since there isn't one at all now, uh, and to get a general incidence and understanding of what injuries are actually causing the TBI and SCI in the field, which would then allow us to guide uh, to, to prevention efforts. Um, and through that specifically, we wanted to look at equipment, what modifications could be done to that, and also whether the equipment that they're actually given is being used in the field. So for the methods of the study, we included all soldiers who were US Army Special Forces qualified, um, which is an 18 series designation. And they also had to have completed the neurological portion of the questionnaire. Um, in close collaboration with the Green Beret Foundation and the Department of Neurosurgery here at Sinai, and then also at Cleveland Clinic, we developed a 162 question extensive survey that encompassed military background and demographics, a neurosurgical history, family history, and all the different types of injuries. It was extremely comprehensive with the number of deployments and how long they were there for, all the different types of exposures. We really went all out to, to, to get as specific data as possible, and it was well validated by probably 10 different people, both with military expertise and medical expertise. And for statistical analysis, we use standard statistics ranging from descriptive to chi-square tests to t-tests and all the significance was set at P less than 0.05. In terms of our results, so right now there are about 7,000 active duty special forces soldiers. Um, because we worked with the Green Beret Foundation, we had access to a lot of soldiers who were uh, who are now veterans or who are separated from the military. And so we were able to access a, around 6,000 in combination of active duty and retired. And so from that, we were able to reach 492 responses, um, which is about an 8% response rate, which is actually pretty good given the fact that a lot of people are deployed. And so it, it makes it difficult to reach them for obvious reasons. In terms of demographics, all special forces soldiers are male. Um, the average age that we had for respondents was 51 years old, and we had a, a wide variety of service ranges from the end of World War II in 45 to 2019. In terms of injury incidents, so for mild TBI, it was reported in almost 42% of respondents, and for moderate and severe TBI, the incidence was about 22%. And then for spinal cord injury, it was it was quite high as well at 19%. And in terms of significant associations that were noted, um, there was one between post 9-11 special forces soldiers and acquiring a moderate or severe TBI diagnosis. And then there was also an association between being a pre 9-11 special forces soldier and obtaining a spinal cord injury diagnosis. 
So the three charts here are looking at attributed causes. So the two most common causes for both acquiring a mild TBI, which we defined as concussion versus a moderate severe TBI, which was a true TBI, there was the same causes all around, but with the leading one being a blast explosion or IED, and the second leading cause being airborne operations. And for the attributed causes of spinal cord injury, the leading cause by far was airborne operations. In terms of protective equipment, over 80% of those who responded having a TBI or an SCI diagnosis were actually wearing headgear at the time of injury. And similarly for spinal cord injury, 37% were wearing body armor at the time of diagnosis. And the graph here below actually separates the spinal cord injury diagnoses by pre 9-11 and post 9-11 special forces soldiers. And what's interesting here is that we see that the uh, amount of body armor use has actually increased over time, which makes sense as we've learned more about injuries, but the fact that we're still seeing uh, a spinal cord injury in these post 9-11 special forces soldiers, and that is actually statistically significant still. So this is probably the most interesting correlation is actually between traumatic brain injury and being a sniper qualified special forces soldier. And so here we see a statistically significant association between being a sniper and obtaining a mild TBI diagnosis, and then also statistically significant with a moderate and severe TBI diagnosis. In terms of the frequency of TBIs that we're seeing, um, on the left, we looked at how many times they were diagnosed with a mild TBI or concussion, and we see that the average number was two to three times over the course of their career. Um, but also a significant number, about 17%, had four to six diagnoses of concussion. And then if we look at true traumatic brain injury, the vast majority said that they only had one true TBI, and that was 63%. But nevertheless, two to, uh, nevertheless about 24% reported having two or three true traumatic brain, brain injuries over the course of their career. So this slide is a lot, but the main takeaways was to look at comorbid conditions and the associations with TBI and SCI. So the main takeaway is that uh, arthritis, low sperm count, low testosterone, um, erectile dysfunction, sleep apnea, tinnitus, and then the mental illnesses that we all think of with TBI like PTSD, they were all statistically significant with both true TBI, mild TBI, and spinal cord injury. The only one that didn't for some reason was erectile dysfunction and true TBI. And we're not quite sure why that is. Um, it could just be because of the data, but um, other than that, it, everything was statistically significant with all three. In terms of medevac rescue, for those that reported a true TBI, a striking only 25% were actually medevaced out of the field at the time of their injury. And then for those who had a spinal cord injury, only 17% were medevaced to, the, to a hospital. So TBI is the signature wound by and large of modern day warfare. And our results demonstrate a really high incidence of TBI among US Army Special Forces soldiers. And while it has long been established that exposure to blasts leads to TBI, there's actually been minimal investigation into whether repeated firing of heavy weapons, both in training and in combat, can lead to TBI over time, given the significant levels of blast overpressure. And so cognitive deficits have actually been reported in the past in DOD research investigating the effects of blasts from heavy weapons firing, such as with the Gustav recoilless rifle. And another DOD study actually discovered higher concussion incidents and symptoms from those concussions in soldiers with a history of blast exposure, explosion from these shoulder fire weapons. Um, and so what we what we did is we expanded this, wor this work um, and our research showed that snipers, which are actually the most exposed group when you think about it to these low level blasts, have this statistically significant association with acquiring TBI. And so our finding in that sense is really unprecedented in, in the military medical literature because it corroborates this theory of subconcussive neurological injury following repetitive low level blast exposure. And so Given this association between TBI and snipers, we recommend additional investigation in all occupations that involve repeated weapons firing, including police and other military branches. And the other thing too, is that repeat TBI was really common among special forces soldiers, which is a finding that's parallel to TBI sustained from football and, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. And when that all came out in the NFL, those findings led to drastic changes in helmet design. They revolutionized safety gear and rules in American sports. 
And this finding might have similar implications for military gear and appropriate timing to return to duty after sustaining a TBI, similar to return to play in football. And the fact that 80% of TBIs occurred while wearing headgear reflects inadequate protective equipment or perhaps that there's some other underlying issue there. Right now, there's actually no requirement to safeguard against blast-induced brain injury in the Army's current advanced combat helmet, um, nor their integrated head protection system. And so it's therefore possible that helmets right now aren't tailored specifically to protect against this repeated low-level blast overexposure from weapons, or that snipers actually might not even be wearing their helmets at all in the field. Snipers will typically go for two to three days um, and not move. Um, and truly be in the middle of nowhere. And because of their positions and the ergonomics of, of how they're, they're planning their, their actions, they often will not actually wear their helmet, even though they, they should in theory. Um, so this is significant in special forces given their long-term exposure to weapons training, and then also just their prolonged direct combat warfare over the course of their career. So in terms of spinal cord injury, the leading etiology was airborne operations. This actually hasn't changed from pre-9-11 to post-9-11 service members. And this is probably related to the fact that being a paratrooper is one of the military occupations of the Green Berets. But what's most significant, in my opinion, is this low rate of medevac rescue, which might suggest that medical rescue isn't attainable at the time, which I touched on a little bit earlier with the fact that they're not usually at the main bases. Um, and because they're typically in an enemy territory, they can't just have a military helicopter come drop down and pick them up and then bring them to safety. So a lot of things um, are, are put on hold. And then the other one is that certain spinal cord injuries might have been deemed minor at the time of injury when they occurred in the field. And and typically, special forces operates in these 12 man groups where one man is a medic and they're the one who's really truly responsible for assessing any trauma that occurs. And so it, it could be possible that the protocols in place right now for assessing the severity of the spinal cord injury just might not be quite up to par to, to assess whether it's truly an, emer like an emergent intervention is needed to, to either decompress the cord or, or whatever it may be. Um, and so perhaps there's room for improvement there as well to, to just to better optimize that. And then lastly, the fact that body armor use has increased in post 9-11 soldiers makes sense as science has progressed, but the fact that it's still occurring at such a high rate shows that there's a need for better optimized technologies, especially in body armor gear and for those who are still um, jumping out of airplanes and who are paratroopers. So, in, you know, there's so much work to be done here. This is a group that sacrifices a lot for the good of the country. And I hope that there'll be future research in this as we've now been able to identify where the needs are from a neurosurgical perspective. There are so many people that I would like to thank for making this work possible. It has truly been a life-changing experience working on this and tackling a serious issue that hasn't really been looked at before in neurotrauma. And I'd first like to thank my neurosurgery mentors here at Mount Sinai, um, Dr. Hodge Panayas, Dr. Srivastava, Dr. Steinberger. They have really guided me every step of the way here. Um, and I credit so much, so much to them for how much I've learned here and for all the wisdom they've shared. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Benzel at the Cleveland Clinic, who I actually had a spinal cord injury grant with through the CNS, and she helped me spearhead this SCI work as well. And then I also want to thank the Green Beret Foundation and Colonel William Davis, Lieutenant Colonel Dennis Downey, and Sergeant First Class Mark Christensen, all of whom have played a huge role in my life and who inspire me every day. They actually came to Spine Section this year in March pre-COVID to hear one of these talks, and it was a very special thing, and it really brings this research home for me to see the human side of it and, and the people that it really directly impacts. Um, if you're interested in the future directions of our work, um, we have our, our website at sfneurosurgery.org. We actually recently partnered with the command surgeon at the special operations headquarters, um, and we're looking forward to investigating other types of neurosurgical illness um, within this population and hopefully giving back in some small way. Thank you. Awesome work, Remy. I just want to say a few words uh, about just all the effort that she put into this project. You know, we provided some guidance, but it was really her and her team that that led this with the questionnaire, really reaching out to our special forces, establishing relationships and connections that are really becoming quite fruitful and developing into other projects that are going to be quite meaningful and impactful. So. Uh, kudos to you, Remy. I mean, I, I really like your initiative and drive, and I think 
the special forces um, group to need our attention. And there's clearly some some challenges that you're you're addressing and possible solutions that we could provide for spinal cord injury and TBI. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Hello. Hold on, just getting the feedback. So Remy, this is Ernest. You have done an extraordinary job. This is outstanding work. And um, your work obviously has implications for national security, foreign policy, and public health. So, uh, uh, you know, TBI is, I would say, still an under-recognized uh, major public health concern nationally and even globally. What would you say the implications of this work are for TBI and the general population? And then uh, second question, I'll definitely check out your website. Can you speak to some of the follow-up studies planned? Yeah, absolutely. So I think right now we're primarily focused on addressing TBI in the military and how the, some of the novel correlations that we found and, and just the, the, the data that we've collected can, can impact them and then also similar occupations like other military branches such as the Navy SEALs um, and then also police forces nationwide. Um, so, so that's mainly the focus of TBI right now. Um, of course, you know, this can have some implication for, for civilian life as well, but the, the types of injuries seen are, are, are pretty different. Um, in terms of future studies, we're really looking at two different avenues. So one is looking at pre and post deployment soldiers and, and looking at what we can do prospectively. So one is that we wanna get imaging, probably MR imaging to look at and see if there's any type of micro trauma that we can identify before and after and see if that correlates with TBIs that are reported while they're deployed. And then the second thing that we're looking at doing is developing a computational model that would simulate blasts from this repeated weapons firing um, because once we're able to collect some data and sort of design what might be the, the cause of the mild, the mild TBIs, that that could actually lead to changes in headgear design, which would ultimately protect against TBI prophylactically. So those are the two things that we're looking at now. And then other neurosurgical illnesses that um, special forces actually has an increased incidence of brain tumors. And so we wanna look at that specifically too. So we have studies that are, are gonna start on that topic as well. Awesome, great work, thank you. Hey Remy, how are you? This is Trevor. Uh, great talk, really awesome research. I uh, just had a quick question. Uh, wanted to, I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Trevor, I can't hear you. Sorry, is that better? Uh, there's a lot of echo, but I, I will try. Uh, sorry, we're just having a little feedback in the room. I um, just wanted to uh, check um, and see if you had discussed any uh, programs for rehabilitation for the uh, soldiers that are uh, have been uh, afflicted with TBI or spinal cord injury and see if there's any connection that you can look for following outcomes uh, from the research you've already uh, generated. That's, that's a really great suggestion. You know, right now we had just focused on, on establishing a profile of what was even going on in special forces. And so we didn't look at it from a post TBI perspective or from a rehab perspective, but that's definitely a great avenue that we should look into to see if we can um, sort of trace their path after they come back. Awesome, thanks. Great. I think we'll get moving on to uh, Sean. Thank you, Remy, for your presentation and for answering those questions. Um, so Sean is going to be talking to us today about using big data in um, primarily spine neurosurgery research um, and a variety of projects that he's worked on over the years here as a student, um, I think each building on the previous. So uh, Sean, go ahead, get started. Great. Thanks so much. Just share my screen here. I'm having a little bit of trouble. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Morgenstern, for introducing me. And I just, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody for allowing me to rotate these past seven or so weeks. And, um, and really for allowing me to be so involved with the, with the department over the past three and a half years. 
Um, I've had a lot of fun. I've learned a lot and it's, it's been a really great experience so far. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about how we've used big data to elucidate trends and target areas for quality improvement in healthcare overall, specifically with kind of a neurosurgical focus. And like I kind of mentioned, this is really the focus of, this is really kind of the breadth of research we've performed as a group over the last three and a half years. And there's a lot of people that I'm going to want to thank at the end of this. This is really the culmination of the entire team's work. So just starting off, the, the three objectives for our studies really are, are one, to, to find trends in healthcare that are interesting, two, to look at how we can do a better job predicting risk of poor outcomes, and three, to find some quality improvement targets that we can, that we can take action on. And so just taking a look at the big picture overall, this is a graph of age-adjusted mortality in the United States from neurological diseases over the past 20 years. And you can see here, we've done a really good job. Can you all see my cursor? Here. Yeah. Okay. So we've done a really great job here with cerebrovascular mortality in the past 20 years, down from about 62 deaths per 100,000 to just under 40, which, some of which we attribute to uh, some of the great technological advances we've seen in that field. But you, you do see a kind of a concomitant rising trend in neurodegenerative diseases. And it's actually increased since 2013. So that kind of overall creates this U-shaped curve of neurological diseases with the inflection point being 2012 or 2013. What this really does is it highlights the importance of neurological diseases as a public health issue, something we really need to tackle. Now, getting into that potential trend in cerebrovascular mortality, I wanna focus on intracerebral hemorrhage for a second. Now, what we did was we took a national data set that includes all the hospitalizations in the United States over the past 15 or so years, and we looked at their short-term in-hospital case fatality for patients admitted with their primary diagnosis as intracerebral hemorrhage. And what we found was that we're, we're seeing a decrease of about 2.5% per year, which was a statistically significant decrease over the past 15 years. And we really hope to continue this trend. We are seeing this in subarachnoid hemorrhage as well. I'm not going to present on it today, but we are seeing decrease in mortality as well. So that could be underlying that decrease in cerebrovascular mortality that we are seeing. But it wasn't enough just to look in the past. We wanted to project out to the future of what neurosurgeons were going to be doing, in, um, doing uh, in terms of their case volume. So what we did was we took that same national data set and we identified instances of spine surgery, four main spine surgeries, anterior and cerv uh, posterior cervical and lumbar fusions. And using data from the U.S. Census Bureau, we were able to create incidence calculations of these procedures and then project out over the next 20 years what we're going to see uh, in terms of those case volumes. And as you can see here, that we definitely expect surgeons to be busy over the next 20 years or so. Moving into our efforts in risk prediction, I want to talk about frailty for a second. So this is a paper that was published in The Lancet, and it developed and validated something called the Hospital Frailty Risk Score. So this was uh, a paper out of Britain. What they were able to do is they went back two years in the administrative records of a a ton of patients, and they identified 110 diagnostic administrative codes that were associated with frailty. And there are some kind of classic ones that, that would make a lot of sense, like osteoporosis, but there are also some interesting codes like a humerus fracture, because that probably indicates that the person had a fall, and then they might have had um, some brittle bones as well. It's pretty difficult to fracture a humerus without being frail in the first place. So they, they kind of took what would have been an interesting approach to frailty. And uh, this paper has been cited about 170 times since it was published two years ago. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to validate it in the spine population. So we took about uh, well over 11,000 patients that were undergoing spine surgery at Mount Sinai. And um, we grouped them by their frailty status. Now this low, medium, and high frailty designation is based on how many, or is based on the original paper. It's their designation of their weighted scoring system from those 110 administrative codes. And when we look at the, the medium and high frailty patients as compared to the low frailty patients, we really see drastic increases in their resource utilization metrics, their rates of total complications, non-home discharge, and then their length of stay and total cost. And these are adjusted differences in cost. And you can see that the high frailty patients cost about $50,000 more than the low frailty patients. Now, we did have a relatively small cohort for this. And, um, this is certainly a, an area we need to explore a little bit further is this kind of high frailty cohort. Um, this work was led by Theo Hanna. He's an awesome third year medical student. And this is just the degenerative spine population. So we definitely want to extend this out to other populations as we go, go from there. The next thing I want to talk about is, is readmissions. And this is a paper from a group at Google. And they used 
a huge cohort of patients with 40, over 46 billion data points. They threw a really complex machine learning algorithm at it in an effort to try and predict readmission, which patients were going to come back to the hospital within 30 days. And Unfortunately, readmissions are difficult to predict. You know, this, this is um, a huge patient cohort with the most complex deep learning algorithm thrown at it. And we were, they were only able to get an AUC, their receiver operating characteristic, of about 0.75, which if you're familiar with these ROCs, it's, it's solid, but it's not fantastic. So we wanted to take a stab at it in the spine population in the hopes that we could get a kind of a more um, a uh, more consistent cohort and identify some factors. So this work led by Mike Martini, a, again, an awesome third year MD PhD student. Uh, we used um, an interesting machine learning algorithm that allows us to understand which features or which variables were most important to predicting readmission risk in terms of the model using them. And this, this really gets at kind of a large issue with machine learning algorithms, which is that a lot of times these, these models end up becoming kind of a black box. You don't know what variables the the algorithm is using and which ones are really important for understanding the risk. So we, uh, we were able to see that, you know, some obvious variables like age, important for readmission risk, right? The, the older the patient, the higher the readmission risk, but also kind of an interesting finding, oral morphine equivalents received during the surgery. If you convert all the opioids they received during the surgery to, to morphine equivalents, the higher the morphine equivalents, the higher the readmission risk, which, which does um, identify some interesting things. However, when we when we did look at that AUC, uh, we were only able to get uh, an AUC of about 0 0.72, which um, again, you know, kind of in that solid but not, not fantastic category. So this is something that we hope to improve on um, in the future. And the last thing I want to talk about is, is using these classical comorbidity measures, the Charlson and the Elixhauser indices. And these are the two original papers led by Mary Charlson and Anne Elixhauser. The Charlson index is a comorbidity comorbidity index of about 17 comorbidities. The Elixhauser index includes, uh, it used to be 31 and now it's 30 comorbidities. These are all dichotomized and then a score is created based on whether the patients have the comorbidities or not. They're very well validated throughout a wide variety of patient populations, but we wanted to look at them in spine surgery. So we took two national cohorts of patients undergoing anterior and posterior cervical fusions. I know this is a huge table, there's a lot of numbers here and a lot of p-values, a lot of them significant. We ran models trying to predict 15 different post-operative complications with the Elix housing and the Charleston indices. And um, just to kind of summarize our findings, we either found that the Elix Hauser index was superior or that the two indices were equivocal. And kind of what this is suggesting to us is that if you're trying to predict complications after spine surgery using a comorbidity measure, or you're trying to risk adjust in spine surgery, it's really better to use the Elix Hauser index than the Charleston index, even though it's a little bit more complex to make because it's more comorbidities, it's going to give you better predictive ability and, and therefore risk adjustment ability when you're trying to uh, look at the spine surgery population. So the last, the last kind of area of our projects is, is finding targets for quality improvement. And I, I want to touch on non-home discharge for a second. So this is, a, this is an orthopedics group actually out of Mount Sinai. And what they were able to do is they looked at patients undergoing total joint replacement. And when they compared the patients who were discharged to home and versus non-home destinations, controlling for how sick they were, uh, their baseline characteristics, how invasive the procedure was, et cetera, they found that um, being discharged to a facility was associated with higher rates of post-discharge complications and readmissions. So this is something we decided to look at in the spine population. And based on these three procedural cohorts, anterior posterior cervical fusions and posterior lumbar fusions, we did see, again, controlling for how sick the patients were, uh, their demographic factors, how invasive the procedures were, et cetera that being discharged to a non-home destination was associated with those post-discharge complications and it was associated with readmissions as well. And you know, just in discussing these findings, it's, it's important to make the point that we're not gonna advocate for patients to be discharged home unsafely. And that just doesn't make any sense. But prior research has actually shown that um, the CMS quality rankings, the Medicare quality ranking uh, ratings for these facilities don't actually correlate with the post-discharge outcomes of the patients that are going to these facilities. And um, it's just important to be mindful of, uh, you know, kind of the heterogeneity in some of these facilities and, and to understand that, you know, if we can get patients home, it'd be great to get them home. 
So this is, this is definitely an active area of research for us. And we, we are looking into this more, uh, both in other procedural cohorts and, and looking at those quality ratings as well. Moving on to DVT and PE prophylaxis. This is a paper that was published in the Annals of Surgery. This is actually a, a trauma surgery group out of USC. And uh, they, they took a cohort of patients with isolated traumatic brain injury. They removed the patients with polytrauma. And they were comparing patients who received low molecular weight heparin to unfractionated heparin, both on the basis of their DVT and PE rates, but also on the basis of mortality. And what they found was that low molecular weight heparin was associated with lower rates of DVT and PE, but also decreased mortality in the TBI population. So we wanted to look at that in the spine trauma population. So again, we found kind of an isolated cohort of patients who had spine trauma. So we excluded the patients who had unsurvivable injuries, who were discharged within 24 hours, those who died in the ED, and we also excluded the polytrauma patients. Um, so we were able, really able to find an isolated population of patients with just spine trauma. And when we did an adjusted analysis, again, adjusting for age, the severity of their injury, uh, their baseline vital signs when they got admitted to the hospital, and uh, as well as if they had a spinal cord injury or, uh, or required surgery for their, for their spine trauma, we found that there were lower rates of thromboembolic complications by about 20% adjusted difference. But what's more interesting is we actually found a 53% reduction in mortality in the low molecular weight heparin cohort compared to the unfractionated heparin cohort. So when we wrote up the paper, we, we, uh, call, we actually called for a randomized trial to be performed because previous trials have um, had a low number of events or a low number of patients. And this is certainly something that we hope to investigate more in the future. And the last thing I want to talk about is surgical scheduling. So previous literature has shown that uh, both the day of the week, at least in spine surgery, and the surgical start timing in joint replacement can affect outcomes in terms of um, whether the patients are leaving the hospital uh, on time, and then there's a corresponding cost difference that goes along with that. So we wanted to look at this in a spine cohort, um, at, at least at the surgical start time, but what, what's difficult is a lot of the national databases won't have the time that the surgery started. So we decided to look at it in the Sinai cohort, and uh, what we did was we compared patients who whose surgery started before and after 2 p.m. So this is the adjusted difference in both days of length of stay and cost between the patients with using the, uh, the before 2 p.m. cohort as the reference. As you can see here, there are significant differences in the anterior posterior cervical fusions and the posterior lumbar fusion patients. You can see here, uh, they're staying 0.7 days, 1.2 days, half a day longer. Um, and then there's a corresponding cost difference that kind of matches up with that kind of understanding that cost uh, of a day in the hospital is about $2,300. So, you're probably asking yourself, oh, well, okay, so these are significant. Why did he include the ones that aren't significant on there, like anterior lumbars, deformity surgery, microdiscs, et cetera? Well, so when we make a surgical schedule, right, it, it doesn't make sense. You only have so many first starts of the day, so it doesn't make sense to always put every patient as a first start. It, it, it won't work out that way. So if, for instance, you needed to perform a, a posterior lumbar fusion and a microdisc one day, it would make sense based on these results, at least, to put the patient who's getting the posterior lumbar fusion first during the day and um, put the patient who's getting the micro disc uh, kind of later in the day or their after 2 p.m. start if that's going to be required. Because chances are that patient with the micro disc is going to go home the next day anyway versus the patient with the posterior lumbar fusion who might be able to, to shave some time off their hospital admission from that. So just to kind of recap all these findings, I know, I know this is a lot, it was a little bit disjointed. So some of the trends we saw in neurological diseases in the United States are increasing. It's definitely an important public health issue going forward. However, we are seeing improvements in short-term mortality after ICH, and we do expect surgeons to be busy in the coming years. Uh, as far as risk prediction goes, we were able to validate that HFRS as a predictor of frailty in spine surgery patients, kind of look at some interesting uh, interesting factors that contribute to readmissions, although uh, some work to do there in terms of predicting them. And then finally, uh, show that the elix hazard index is better than the Charleston index for predicting risk after spine surgery. And finally, as far as QI targets go, we, uh, we found some interesting things about surgical start time and how to optimize that, how to improve DVT prophylaxis, potentially the mortality benefit. And then finally, um, some interesting things about non-home discharge and risk for post-discharge complications and readmissions. So 
and I, I mentioned this earlier, none of this would be possible without the nearly 40 people on this slide. Um, we have a really awesome team of people and, and this ranges from everybody from full professors all the way down through undergrads. And um, truly none of this work would be possible without them. This presentation is, is, has really been the result of a team effort and I can't make that point clear enough. Um, so with that, thank you so much for your, the time to present and uh, I'll take any questions now. Nice job, Sean. I, I have one question to sort of lead it off. Um, you know, big, big data research has been something that has increasingly come to the fore over the last five to 10 years. And it, it's obviously complicated. There, there's a wide range of quality in the studies that come out from with big data in quotes um, with varying degrees of sort of controls and management of confounders. So can you comment a little bit, since you've done a number of these studies now in a row, on the importance of controlling your confounders and focusing your research questions and not just throwing a handful of darts at the wall to avoid coming to potentially erroneous and impactful conclusions? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important point. I, I you know, thank you for bringing it up because it's, it's the most common comment that we get from both reviewers and just from people that you talk to about, you know, kind of the research you do. And I, I want to actually highlight these results here because I think they, they illustrate um, kind of an interesting statistical test that, that we are now using. So um, over here in the right hand column is something called the E value. And this is actually a measure of the strength that an unmeasured confounder would need to be to make this association over here not real. So the higher the E value, the stronger this conclusion um, can kind of be pushed. And um, if you see here that the mortality E value is 3.7 or almost 3.7, whereas the rest of them are a little bit lower, this is kind of an interesting technique that can be used to kind of alleviate some of those concerns. The other thing is, um, is a Bonferroni correction, which is where you drop your p-value, your statistical significance level, to make sure that um, you're, you're uh, adjusting for multiple comparisons. And I think when big data research is done uh, the right way, you can really find some awesome conclusions from it. And, and the other thing is, you know, um, we, we obviously have a big group of, of trainees that are working in these areas. And, and whenever people ask me about the value of performing research early in med school, is, I think it's really important to get your feet wet early and to, um, you know, and to really understand the process. And I think big data research is a really great way for med students to be directly involved um, in a very, at a very early stage. Sean, that was a really great presentation. I mean, obviously shows uh, the extent of your uh, engagement with, with all these different uh, techniques and uh, the breadth of your knowledge. Um, to extend a couple of the things that Peter said, um, <clears throat> for these, for there are so many different kinds of administrative databases that are available. So as you were beginning to explore your uh, how to start analyzing some of these databases, what advice would you have for uh, medical students who are looking to get involved in this, uh, where should they start and what sort of resources should they be focusing on as they, as they start analyzing this data? Yeah, so I think um, finding an established group that does this and, and has uh, experts in the area really makes a huge difference. I, you know, I, um, actually in first year of medical school, I, I got involved with a general surgery group that was doing some research with this. And, and that's where I kind of picked up kind of the beginnings of, of statistical analysis and um, how to work with these big databases. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't say enough good things about the, the now vascular surgery fellow who taught me these, these initial steps, because it, when somebody just sits down with you for an hour and, and takes the time to go through a database and say like, okay, well, these are the things you need to watch out for. And these are statistical analytical methods you need to use. Um, I, that really made a huge difference. Um, and unfortunately, the only other way is, is you have to go read the data dictionary, which is, is very, very painful, but um, you, know, you know, it does, it does obviously find a lot of information there as well. I really liked your cerebrovascular and ICH slide showing that mortality was coming down over time. There's kind of a general refrain in the literature that despite this and this advance, mortality has not changed over time. You know, I'm sure you've seen that uh, basically on repeat 
um, in the ICH literature, for example. And so when I see that number, I'm curious uh, to address confounders, how you can address confounders in that analysis, um, or if you can just look at all the confound or all the factors you know that also play a role in mortality and show that those were the same throughout the population over time, but that the mortality did decrease. Yeah, so um, so this is this is uh, one slide from a larger paper that you've also been involved with, as you know. And yeah. um, when we, you know, when we did part of that analysis, we did adjust for um, the patient's age, their comorbidity burden, all these things. Unfortunately, with the national databases, one of the big uh, gripes that I and everybody else has is, is, you know, we don't have the volume of the ICH and, and the location of it. Some of these other factors that are very important in determining mortality. And, um, you know, I think as we, as we move forward with big data, identifying uh, specific cohorts of patients that will likely be grouped by, other, by either specific diseases or specific procedures and really understand, the get with the guidelines, stroke folks um, do a really good job of this and identifying factors that are associated with mortality and then um, being able to analyze that data will be really, really important. And, um, you know, that's certainly a limitation of our cohort here um, is that we don't have all those factors that are important for predicting mortality. Do you see, along those lines, do you see administrative databases adapting to change their um, variable log? Somewhat. I would say the one that is adapted the most is, is that, I, that, that I've worked with at least has been NISCLIP. Um, they've really focused more over the past few years upon um, reasons for readmissions, patients that return to the OR, why they're going back to the OR, things like that. Um, for the most part, the, at least the, the governmental data sets have not quite been as, um, as uh, malleable, I guess you could say, in terms of, in terms of updating their variable list. But, you know, I think uh, the private databases, like I mentioned, the Get With The Guidelines folks, um, do a pretty solid job of filling in that gap for disease and procedure-specific uh, companies. Great, really awesome, thank you. Thanks. Do we have any other questions from the rest of the group for either Sean or our other two presenters? All right, we'll take that as a no. So thank you everyone for listening um, and we will be scheduling George and Jacques to present in September um, to give them enough time to adequately show their work and have time for discussion. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, despite all the noise in the background.